We're pleased to welcome you to the AUSA Noon Report, a new virtual series featuring senior Army leaders that provide important updates on key defense topics. Kicking off today's event is the President and Chief Executive Officer of the Association of the United States Army, General Carter Ham. Good afternoon and welcome to the Association of the United States Army's Noon Report, a series of events to bring you senior defense leaders speaking on topics of current interest in a live interactive forum. We're really glad that you joined us today and appreciate your continued support. AUSA is pleased to support the Army's continuing efforts to address the issues of race, inclusiveness, and equality. Tragic events over the past months have raised national awareness of these issues, and the Army's senior leaders have taken on these matters directly, establishing programs, revising policies, and fostering the sometimes uncomfortable conversations that must occur if the Army is to improve. Today's noon report is the fourth in a series of discussions about race in the Army. The earlier sessions are accessible via AUSA's website at ausa.org. Let me introduce today's three distinguished speakers. For more about them, you can access their full bio biographies in the handout tab on the upper right-hand corner of your screen. Lieutenant General Darrell Williams is the 60th Superintendent of the United States Military Academy at West Point. He graduated from West Point in 1983 and was commissioned a second lieutenant in the field artillery. He has led at every level, including three-star command of NATO's Allied Land Command headquartered in Turkey. He holds master's degrees in leadership development, military art and science, and national security and strategic studies. Major General John Evans is the commanding general of United States Army Cadet Command in Fort Knox. He is a 1988 distinguished military graduate from Appalachian State University. General Evans has long experience in special operations aviation and most recently commanded Army Special Operations Aviation Command Airborne. He earned a Master of Arts degree in adult education from Kansas State University and, like General Williams, a Master of Arts in National Security and Strategic Studies from the U.S. Naval War College. Sergeant Major Julie Guerra, joining me here at AUSA, is the Senior Enlisted Leader for the Department of the Army G2, the Army's Intelligence Directorate. She has a Bachelor of Liberal Arts from Excelsior College and has graduated every level of the non-commissioned officer education system. Her extensive military intelligence career has taken her to just about every part of the Army, including service as a military intelligence brigade command sergeant major, the command sergeant major for the Army's Cyber Corps, and the Cyber School command sergeant major. If you have questions for our speakers today, please use the Q&A tab located on the lower right side of your screen. We'll try to get to as many of your questions as time will allow. We'll begin today with introductory remarks from each of our speakers, then we'll have a, a conversation with each of the three of them, and then we'll turn to your audience questions. So to begin our conversation today, let's, let's begin with Lieutenant General Williams from West Point. Good afternoon, and first let me say thank you to General Ham and AUSA for hosting this panel and the opportunity for us to share our perspectives on this very important topic. We've all heard our Secretary of the Army and our Chief, General McConville, talk about the importance of people and winning, a people first mentality and a winning matters attitude, or the mindset that serves as the cornerstone for Army readiness. We went through people, the Army's greatest strength. Specifically, we went through cohesive teams by doing the right things the right way. West Point's mission is to educate, train, and inspire leaders of character. We develop the young men and women who will help build and lead those cohesive teams throughout the Army, preparing those teams to win in the crucible of ground combat. The outcome of our 47-month experience is leaders of, of impeccable character who live honorably, lead honorably, and demonstrate excellence in all they do. Character development is woven into every aspect of the cadet development experience. 
We call it a culture of character growth because we recognize that demonstrating good character and providing moral leadership are essential for good officership. Character is more than our honor code. Character also includes aspirational ideals, like living above the common level of life, choosing the harder right over the easier wrong. And as we aspire to demonstrate excellence, that we seek excellence in our character, just being kind to each other. Racism has no place at the United States Military Academy. Like the United States Army, we are committed to eradicating racism within our ranks. Ultimately, it's a readiness issue because racism breaks down trust and cohesion necessary for cohesive winning teams. This is about treating all people with dignity and respect, with kindness and compassion, simply treating people the way we want to be treated. Building diverse and effective winning teams has been a top priority of mine since my arrival at the Academy back in 2018. Our ongoing efforts in this space are synchronized with Army priorities. Aligned with the Army's project inclusion, throughout summer training, we've engaged in some frank and honest conversations, tough conversations with our cadets. And I know my wingman, John, has done the same thing, both formally and informally. We are listening with an intent to hear and act as appropriate. We are carrying this momentum into the new academic semester with several initiatives to include our ongoing Honorable Living Day series. Our next Honorable Living Day, which will be held later this month, will focus heavily on inclusive leadership and how we ensure all, the, all of the academy feels like they are part of a squad rather than in a squad. I'll say that again, rather part of a squad rather than in a squad. Our cadets are owning and leading these efforts. As soldiers in the United States Army, every one of us, regardless of our race or our gender, are bound together as one team by two fundamental things, the shared values of the Army profession, and most importantly, the oath each of us took and our cadets will take to support and defend the Constitution of the United States of America. At the United States Military Academy, we have the opportunity to be the gold standard in that arena to show the nation what is possible when people from diverse backgrounds unite for a noble purpose and dedicate themselves to living honorably. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions and the discussion ahead. Thank you, sir. Well, thanks very much, General Williams, for those introductory remarks. I, I'm sure uh, that will elicit some questions from our audience. Again, and for the audience, you can uh, post your questions at the Q&A Q tab on the bottom right-hand side of your, of your screen. So we'll turn now to Major General John Evans at Cadet Command. And many of you know about senior ROTC that produces officers from colleges and universities across the nation. But General Evans and his command also lead junior ROTC in high schools across the nation as well. General Evans, please. Hey, sir. Thank you. And let me echo uh, General Williams. Uh, thanks to uh, General Ham and AUSA for hosting this forum and having this this uh, very significant and important dialogue. Uh, you know, uh, I always have to follow General Williams in these formats, and I, can, I rarely come up with something more uh, uh, unique to say about, uh, about the, the topic. But I will say that uh, we absolutely uh, supporting all the initiatives that West Point's doing, and we are mirroring them all along the way. General Williams and I, our teams, we work together so that we provide a consistent officer corps for our Army. Uh, and if, as he works to uh, provide a core cadets there at West Point. We're doing the same thing at Army ROTC, uh, and we have an ubiquitous presence across the United States, which puts us in a very unique position to get a feel for what's going on across our country. And as most Americans know, it's been a very tense time. And so as we focus our cadets on not just the elements of diversity, but also the very, very important elements of inclusion as they build teams and foster networks, uh, we have very frank discussions with them about what they're feeling and what they're seeing. And so I believe dialogue like this is very, very important in supporting that. Uh, as we progress through the questions and answers here, I look very forward to talking to you about some of the initiatives that we've got going on at Army ROTC that will address not only uh, diversity uh, as a whole, but also inclusiveness, particularly with regards to what we're doing now to try to bring more officers of color and uh, females into the traditional combat arms. And uh, I look forward to having that discussion 
But uh, let me also echo General Williams in saying once again, thank you for bringing us together. Uh, I look very forward to hearing uh, his comments, comments from the audience, and also the comments from uh, Command Sergeant Major Gear. So thank you, sir. Thanks, General Evans. We look forward to lots of questions uh, for, uh, for you as well from the audience. And turning now here uh, at AUSA in the General uh, Gordon R. Sullivan Conference and Events Center, uh, Sergeant Major Julie Guerra, who's the Sergeant Major uh, for the Army G2. You know, we, we talk a lot, Sergeant Major, and you hear a lot from the senior leaders about uh, emphasis at the squad level. So of our three speakers today, you're the only one who's actually led a squad. <laughs> and so I think your perspectives are, are, are really important. So we welcome and, and thanks for joining us oh, today. Thank you for having me, sir. And to be on the panel with these gentlemen is, is an amazing opportunity. So I, I, I'm gonna talk a little bit about my Army story and kind of how I led my squad along the way and also kind of ended up here. So I was born and raised in Tucson, Arizona. My dad was a plumber and a pastor. My mom was a stay-at-home mom and uh, there were five children in my family, well, six total, including me. The oldest girl, so a lot of responsibility because of our culture was put on me uh, within our family. And uh, that really, from a very young age, put me in a leadership role uh, that was very traditional to how we lead in the Army, that I was unknown, unknown to me at the time, was setting a path for me to be where I am today. So uh, very diverse background, very diverse neighborhoods that I lived in on the east side of Tucson. And when I was 13, moved from Arizona to Indiana, where I was the only a uh, Hispanic person in my school, uh, aside from my brother. And so went from a very diverse community to something that was very polarized and kind of shaped my perception on exactly who I was and how people saw me. And that wasn't something that I was prepared to deal with at 13, 14 years old and had to really um, dive into it head first. So I left Indiana as soon as I graduated from high school moved back to Arizona because that was home for me and always has been considered home and joined the army not too long after that to take advantage of the GI bill and have the army pay for my education. So um, fast forward 26 years, I've been in the Intel community. I've um, been to Korea, Panama, Bosnia, Iraq, I've been in Forcecom, TRADOC and on the Department of the Army staff. This is my second time. And so I've had a lot of opportunities in spite of being a minority female and had very amazing mentors along the way. And it really shaped my perception and perspective on how I could lead um, different genders, different ethnicities, different backgrounds, where people came from. The thing that I always told my soldiers and leaders in every single echelon that I've served at is that everybody has a story. Everyone has a motivation for why they raised their right hand and said that they wanted to serve their country. And it's up to us as leaders to capitalize on that and to make sure that as our squad, as they're in our squad, that we find what motivates them to either retain them or to help them transition so that they can be effective members of this society. Well, thanks, Sergeant Major. I, I have to confess that as you were speaking, uh, in reflecting on my own experience, mine is probably about as opposite from yours as it could be. As I, I grew up in, you know, decidedly comfortable middle class, all white um, suburban Cleveland, Ohio. And, and unlike you, really my first exposure to a very diverse cohort of people was when I enlisted in the army mm -hmm. and found that there, there were lots of people who weren't like me. Right. Uh, so a very, very interesting uh, dichotomy of experiences, I, I think, as we move forward. So we do have some questions now uh, that, to, to talk about. And again, for our audience, please uh, enter your questions at the Q&A tab on the, on the, on the bottom right-hand side of your screen as you, as you see it. Uh, General Williams, if I could uh, toss a question your way to, to get us started. So you are the 60th superintendent at West Point the first African-American superintendent. Um, what is it, what is it meant to you and to others for that kind of groundbreaking historic experience? What's it meant to you and to, in, in, to your family to have been in that circumstance? 
Thank you, sir, and I appreciate that question. I think uh, as I reflect on that, uh, this is, as you mentioned, uh, my third year here as a soup from starting, and uh, I think it first speaks to the rich opportunities, uh, Sergeant Major sort of talked about it, that are available in the United States Army. Um, I grew up in a very diverse background and uh, had parents who'd served. I'm, I'm a legacy. My, my father served two tours in Vietnam. My kids all serve. And, you know, the Army has always been an opportunity place for me. And I think it speaks about the, the values of the United States Army. We were a values-based organization. And I've always found the opportunity to grow over now, starting my 38th year in the Army. Uh, and so it's allowed me to do so. I've come to this place because of the opportunities in the Army and the values that we have in the Army. And then you mentioned my family, I mean, my mother, my father, from a very early age as a career Army officer, um, taught me that uh, there was no ceiling, right? That I could be whatever I needed to be. Uh, and I've always enjoyed that space. Uh, I know others perhaps haven't experienced some of that. So I feel very fortunate that I came from a diverse background, had parents that encouraged me. And then I landed in an organization that allowed me to be um, as much as I could be. And then I think finally, sir, um, in this role here, it's good for the young men and women of all colors, of all, all, all gender, you know, both men and women here to look up and see themselves here as, as the superintendent here. So I'm very proud of the fact that I'm the, the first African-American, but I'm proud to be the superintendent for, for all the, the great young men and women here at the United States Military Academy. Well, thanks, General Williams. And if I could pull on that just a little bit, um, you mentioned to me earlier that the the new class at the Military Academy at West Point, the class of uh, uh, 2024, is the most diverse class ever in West Point's history. So tell us a little bit about that, and more so, why is that important? Sir, thanks for that. Uh, it's important because uh, diversity is a part of building winning teams. One of my line of efforts here is the soup from day one was to build diverse and effective winning teams. And those aren't mutually exclusive things. Uh, what we say here, diversity is we show up uh, the way we were born and then what the organization does to make sure all members of the team feel included is very, very important. Whether you're in a rifle platoon or you're here at West Point, we win because of our diversity and it's incumbent on the leaders, whether it be the leader of the organization or our great tactical, here at West Point, our great tactical officers and non-commissioned officers, which are critical, Sergeant Major here at West Point, um, our coaches and our professors, they help build and shape that clay over their, what we call the 47 month experience here. So we come here and we bring in a diverse team, General, as you said, uh, the, the largest African-American class in the history since 1802, uh, highest, third highest in terms of Hispanic uh, Americans and, and other soldiers, I think it's second highest. So that diverse mix is how our army wins on the battlefield. Here at West Point, we win and they learn how to, to communicate each other, be a part of cohesive teams, and then they transfer that out into the army and become a part of winning teams in our great army and support our values, sir. Well, thanks, General Williams. And obviously we're, we all stand in support and, and look for great things for those uh, uh, young women and men who will who will come out and become army officers, uh, General Evans, turning to you now, is, and I know you've got some some specific programs at the historically black colleges and universities, and predominantly Hispanic uh, colleges and universities. Can you talk a little bit about what you're doing in ROTC to provide role models and to encourage greater diversity in the core of in the core of ROTC cadets throughout the command? Yeah, thanks for that question, sir. And uh, it kind of speaks to some of the things that uh, General Williams talked about. You know, he, he talked about the importance of having diverse teams to solve difficult problems, to bring people from different backgrounds into the discussion so that you come up with a more holistic solution. Uh, where we have been a little reticent in that, frankly, uh, in our Army Officer Corps is in what we call the traditional combat arms, right? So for most of us old guys like us, that means infantry armor, aviation, field artillery, engineer, and ADA. Uh, but probably more, if you want to narrow it down a little bit more, we're building most of our core commanders, most of our combat commanders, service chiefs from the Army out of infantry, armor, aviation, and field artillery. So we've had a bit of a dearth, I think, of uh, diversity in those branches. And in order to build a bench now for 25 to 30 years hence, when we're going to be putting those senior leaders at the three and four star level in charge of our Army and, and in hopes that our Army will look 
like America and that our officer army will look like our enlisted army, we've got to, we've got to make some efforts now to try to get after combat arms as a branch or a trade in the army. Not that we don't value the other um, the other MOSs for Sergeant Major uh, Gary that we can do anything without our, our MI professionals, but but we know that we are building predominantly our senior leaders from the combat arms. So we've got two programs, one that operates at our historical black colleges and universities, and that's called the patent program. Uh, my predecessor, Chris Hughes, started this program. I, I was able to inherit it during its first year, and I can tell you it's it's provided great benefit to us with regards to influencing the decision making of young cadets, particularly African-American cadets at HBCUs, uh, as they consider what branch they want to go into. What we do is we take uh, we take company grade officers, first lieutenants from across the Army. Some of those are African-American, some of them may not be from the combat arms branches, and we put them purposefully at an HBCU for one year so that those cadets can have someone that's very close to their peer group who has already experienced life in the Army as a company grade officer in the combat arms, and they can talk about uh, the value of that contribution to our Army. And I think it's very important that we understand that sometimes, uh, particularly uh, some of our diversity officers out there, will choose non-combat arms because they think that might give them a better stepping off point later in their careers to transition to the career after the Army. But as I tell people all the time, regardless of whether you're going to be a logistician or a signal technician or you're going to work in the cyber field, the one thing that the Army does better than anybody else is it teaches leadership. And so the combat arms is particularly steeped in, the, in that leadership ethos, and that's why we're trying to encourage that. We're running a similar uh, program that's just beginning this year at our HSIs, uh, our historical Spanish institutions, where we will, uh, we will have uh, first lieutenants from uh, hopefully the Hispanic demographic or from a regional demographic there uh, close to the university. And they will also be combat arms officers in hopes that we can encourage uh, members of the Latino community and our Hispanic demographic to also select the combat arms because we, are, again, are suffering a deficit there. Uh, and at the senior leader levels, we need to do better. Um, and as we take a look at the demography of our United States, I think it's important to point out that the Caucasian demographic is on a downslope. The African-American demographic is pretty flat. The Asian American Pacific Islander demographic is rising slightly, but it's a very low density demographic. But the Hispanic demographic in our country is skyrocketing. So if we don't work now to get more uh, officers from the Hispanic demographic into our army and into the key positions, we're not going to have a force that reflects the diversity we want at the senior officer level down the road. Oh, thanks, General. That was certainly a challenging time. And it's, it's actually really uh, interesting to watch some of the initiatives that you're applying across uh, Cadet Command to adapt to that changing demographic. Mm -hmm. Sergeant so Major, if I could uh, turn to you now, okay. you know, as a, as a woman and as a Hispanic, you, 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 you've been a minority in just about every place you've ever been in the Army. What has that meant in terms of seeking out mentors, mentoring others, and what challenges have you encountered and how have you overcome them to arrive where you have arrived at the top of your profession? So I, I think that's a great question. So I think I'll start with, um, you know, kind of the challenges that, that they're not necessarily uh, specific to my ethnicity, but definitely definitely as a female in a male dominated career field, uh, the probably one of the biggest challenges that I faced um, and, and continue to face is that I don't automatically have street cred um, because of my gender. So going into a job, I have to prove myself that much harder. Um, we collectively as, as females in the military have to work harder to prove ourselves to the leaders that our capabilities and our voice are, are valid and that we are just as competent as our male counterparts. And, um, and then build that reputation so that we are tested leaders and members of the team along the way. And that doesn't automatically happen, in my experience, for females uh, as they come up through the military as it does for males. So um, the other thing that I would say is, as a Hispanic minority female, my confidence, comp competence, and leadership style is often called aggressive. And I think a lot of that has to do with uh, you know, other peers and officers that I've worked with that are also minorities come across the same thing, particularly females. And so it's not entirely tied to being a minority, but a lot of it is tied to being a woman in this profession. And um, 
it's certainly viewed differently when we are uh, boisterous or or very direct and candid is that our voice is heard differently than our male counterparts and particularly the person that's on the receiving end um, will view that differently whether regardless of their ethnic background but particularly from a male and it coming from a female leader it's definitely viewed uh, differently which is uh, kind of, I, I still deal with that, even at the, the three-star level on the de Department of the Army staff. So um, I would say for, you know, the the mentors that I've had as a as a drill sergeant, I had um, Sergeant Major Tim Mace, who was my battalion Sergeant Major, who really looked out for me and made sure that I had opportunities within the organization. As a company first sergeant, uh, Sergeant Major Tim Mullins, when I was a drill sergeant, as a non-promotable sergeant first class gave me the opportunity to take my first company as of a basic combat training company as an enabler um, going into uh, an organization that was again all male and all combat arms and then uh, i've also had um sergeant major steve payton when i was a brigade sergeant major in korea he was the usfk sergeant major and he really advocated and mentored and guided me through the nominative process that i understood how this works so um, from my experience, I would say that, you know, in spite of my gender and my ethnic background, um, those, those mentors that I've had have really helped advocate for me and give me opportunities um, because of my work ethic and my reputation and my being able to prove myself regardless of where I came from and my gender. And then I would say for mentorship, I mean, uh, I mentor everyone. Uh, General Barrier, my boss up at the G2, has a saying that if if someone asks you to mentor them, the only answer is yes. And I, I mentor females, uh, Hispanics, Black, Asian, white, males and females um, across the army of all, all grades. And um, so from my perspective, it's, it's definitely important at, at every level that you continue to turn around and grab the hand of the person behind them and kick down the doors to allow other females to come through them and other minorities. Well, thanks, thanks, Sergeant Major. Thanks yes, sir. for for that for those insights and, and and for your personal example. And I think as we've heard throughout our conversation about the race in the army, this the the idea of mentoring becomes central to the. Uh, to improving the conditions. And as Sergeant Major mentioned, you know, it's not only always a senior mentoring a, a junior. You know, generals need mentoring too. And, and sometimes the most effective mentoring for old generals comes from a sergeant's yeah. major, you know, so that's pretty powerful. So thank you very much. Well, let's turn now to our audience questions. We've got a number of good ones uh, coming in. And General Williams, the, the first one is for you. Uh, and that's and that is uh, from uh, Lauren H. Who asks, do you think that the application and the the congressional referral process, the appointment process, serves as a barrier to entry for minority or low income students to apply for admission to West Point? Well, thanks for that question. Um, I think the short answer is I do not. Uh, I will tell you that our admissions committee here works very, our, our admissions director works very hard uh, to work with all of our, our great Congress here. We go out and aggressively reach out and make sure they understand um, that they have an opportunity to uh, shape the arc of a lot of young men and women, cha change the trajectory of their life here. And so we have, um, we very aggressively go out, we host a number of seminars and uh, for the person who asked the question, if you have more about that, I would encourage you to reach out to me or my admissions department or out to John as well. We have a great relationship with, uh, with John and ROTC. If you're interested in becoming a United States Army Lieutenant, uh, West Point or any of our great colleges are a, gro a great way to go. Um, and I, I, don't, I have not seen it in my two years here as a hindrance. Um, I, like I said, we host a number of, of seminars. We actually focus, uh, we have minority seminars. We do it five or six times a year. We have a summer leader experience, which we host for rising seniors. So there's a, there's a lot of um, opportunities for men and women, all men and women, not just men and women of color, to come and experience 
uh, the West Point and learn about West Point. And so far, I have not seen a hindrance. We hindrance. We have um, we accept the less than one to two percent of every applicant. So we have a, a lot of folks trying to come to West Point and to come to our great colleges here. Uh, and um, so, thanks for that question. Thanks, General Williams and uh, General Evans. If I could toss a question to you from uh, Mary T. Uh, and you talked about some of this with uh, uh, the uh, with your earlier comments, but how are how are you working to increase uh, the diversity across ROTC and I would add junior ROTC for your staff and faculty, your senior military instructors? How are you increasing the diversity within cadet command of the staff and faculty, not just the the not only the cadets? Yeah, it's a great question, sir. So you know we're leaning heavily now into. Um, particularly with regards to the staff and faculty. Uh, on the officer side, the new AIM 2.0 process that our officers are using in their assignment cycle has been very, very useful in allowing people that, uh, that uh, have a desire to come and teach at ROTC to give them an inroad to do that. And we've seen that that's actually increased our diversity with regards to our assistant professors of military science. Our senior members of any program, the professor of military science or board selected, We'll run that board here in a couple of weeks. Uh, and we use uh, the standard Army board guidance with regards to selecting a very diverse group of individuals for that. The one area where I think we can do better is uh, with regards to our senior military instructors. Those are generally speaking E7s or E8, Sergeants First Class and Master Sergeants, who serve as the senior NCOs at our programs. Because they're all coded 01 Alpha, Sometimes we don't get the diversity we want there, although we're finding that uh, it's getting better and better as we move down the road. So uh, the O1 Alpha is combat arms specific. So uh, we are doing lots of different things in that regard. Uh, as, as a function of what we do in junior ROTC, while we don't hire the instructors that teach, the almost 3,500 instructors across the country that teach at our 1,700 uh, junior ROTC programs, we do certify those instructors. So we have to review their files to make sure they served honorably and, and have retired honorably uh, before we will give them to the school districts who will actually do the hiring action. They are actually employees of the school districts for which they work. And I'll tell you, we have a very diverse group of folks in our junior ROTC cadre across the country. So we're always looking to enrich that. Uh, we've got uh, some levers that we're pulling right now in the Army with regards to talent management. But uh, great question, and I appreciate that. Good. Thanks, General Evans. And Sorry, Major, if I, if I could turn a question to you, we've got a question uh, from Darlene A, and I'll expand upon that a little bit, but why is it important in your many years of experience for soldiers to voice their opinions about diversity and inclusion? And, and I think that's the, the, the basis for project inclusion. Mm -hmm. And so if you could talk a little bit about project inclusion and how are you applying that within the G2? So thank you, Darlene, for that question. I would say uh, that how we're applying it in the G2, I'll answer that part first, is that we're doing listening sessions uh, across the board where we sit down with uh, every single echelon with inside of the organization. So there's not a lot of enlisted inside of the Department of the Army G2, um, but there is officers uh, from captain all the way up to three star and uh, contractors and DA civilians all the way from up to SES three-star level. So I think that it's important to hear at, at Echelon their experiences and really what they see is a barrier to diversity and inclusion within their organization. So I, to be very frank, Intel is, is uh, probably one of the worst in the army when you look at the officer side of the house uh, with diversity and inclusion. It is um, very white male centric. And so we collectively have had discussions about how we need to do a better job working with uh, West Point and with ROTC, the sources of commission to ensure that minorities have the same opportunities to serve within the intelligence professional as their counterparts. And so that's to me is, is very, very important. As far as giving the soldiers a voice, uh, when it comes to diversity and inclusion, you're not going to know 
unless you actually talk to your soldiers, unless you actually give them a voice, give them the opportunity to say where it is that they feel that there's barriers based on their ethnicity and their gender and be willing to listen. And for some of them, you know, some, some soldiers, they, they could be a white male and they, they grew up in an, an area that was very, where they were the diversity. And so being able to have those conversations about their background, where they came from, regardless of gender, regardless of ethnicity, is critical and it's key. And then just listening. You're not there to solve all the problems. You're there to listen and to see what those experiences are and how it shaped them and, their, and what their view of the world in the Army is. So, Sergeant Major, if I could just follow up a little bit that, you know, that as the Army is and continues to be a globally engaged force, um, that seems to me that particularly in the military intelligence field, uh, that uh, the diversity that you're speaking about contributes to that. You get regional right. understanding, cultural, ethnic understanding, you get language skills. So yeah. in MI, talk a little bit about how you, how you, would recommend expanding that diversity to capture that, uh, that, that those skills uh, within the MI career field? Yeah, so that's a, that's a tough one um, because in order to serve in some of these actual MOSs, you know, they have to have top secret security clearances, um, sensitive compartmented information access. Um, some of them will need access to NSA platforms. And so really, um, th there are very limiting factors to getting into side of some of those some of those roles, um, especially if there's something in their background, like let's say somebody's coming into the army that precludes them from getting that. So uh, I, but what I will say as is as an intel professional that uh, has come from where I came from that really ask the question and see what it is that you can do to get into the career field. Because as we regionally align and we look at languages and we look at the actual experience and skill sets, um, the biggest thing that the Army needs, regardless of profession, um, but of course I'm biased, especially in the military intelligence corps, is somebody that has the drive and wants to win. Just like the chief said, you know, winning matters. And regardless of what that win looks like, um, it might just be a brief about, um, you know, battle assessments or, or an, you know, an intel update to the CG, regardless of what that win looks like um, and those, those backgrounds and everything that feeds into it. I think it definitely is key, but the, uh, to actually answer the question, I think that's, that's really tough to get after every single discipline with inside of the intelligence enterprise and tackle that from just one blanket statement, if but that makes sense. It does, but I, and I think back to your original point, it starts with having that conversation right? and seeing you know, what, what can be done to, to help open those, uh, open those doors. Um, General Williams, uh, a question from the audience about um, a fairly recent letter from some recent graduates from the Military Academy at West Point, um, offering some very public criticism uh, about race uh, inclusiveness uh, at at West Point. Can you talk a bit about, uh, about, about how you're dealing with that uh, letter from some recent graduates? Yes, sir. Thanks for the question. Yeah, we uh, this summer some recent graduates uh, wrote a letter addressed to me and uh, laying out a lot of um, allegations. And so I, I will tell you, as a commander, mm -hmm. you know this uh, at Echelon. Um, my immediate response was to look at it. So we, I think the next week, I think the following Friday, I directed my inspector general to do a formal investigation. Uh, he has a report out to me. Uh, we, are, we are going through the process of it. But what I'll tell you is we received it well. I mean, it's an opportunity uh, to review how we're doing business here at West Point. Um, uh, as uh, some folks know, I may have some, some grads on the line here. Since 1802, uh, there have been cadets, while there have been a, a cadet at West Point, our early years until now, who've experienced some racism. And that was sort of the nexus of the letter, uh, that their time here, uh, they experienced some racism. Uh, I, I, you know, it's an investigation, so I got to be careful about commenting on it. But, uh, you know, we took that and, and taking it on and, and looking at it in a very deliberate way. 
Uh, but I'll tell you, we're, we're taking action now. Uh, we already are on a path, as I mentioned earlier, uh, diverse and effective winning teams, cultivate a culture of character growth, develop leaders of character were my lines of effort. Uh, we've had a series of honorable living days since I've come here. The first few were focused on uh, sexual assault and sexual harassment. Um, the one we're gonna do in a few weeks is focused on racism. Um, things that the chief and the secretary talk about, uh, and the third one being suicide, that breach trust in, in teamwork. And so uh, it's very important that we look at this. I, I welcome uh, the feedback and we're taking a very deliberate focused look at that. Uh, they owe me, uh, in fact, I just met with the team last uh, yesterday, but by the end of the month, I'll have, and so as the Sergeant Major said, to build on what she said, and our great NCOs here are critical in this space, um, we've got to do a lot of listening. And so that's really the heart of um, what we're doing in terms of our diversity inclusion program, what's the Chief and Secretary have mandated us to do. Uh, project inclusion's about Diversity is, inclusion is about what leaders do to make people feel a part of teams. And so we want to make sure we're doing that here at West Point. That's the nexus uh, of what we're doing here. And what's really neat, what's going on right now, sir, and, and um, is that the cadets are in this space. We've provided them the opportunity to talk. Um, we're, we're very busy here. All college students are busy. Uh, arguably, ours are some of the busiest. And oftentimes, we don't stop and take time, as Sergeant Major talked about, and listen. But then it's incumbent on leadership that once we've listened, then we take action. So we look forward to taking action. We're taking action now. Um, I think there's a very, if you come and visit West Point, of course, it's tough right now, given the COVID environment right now. But I think you'll see our young men and women engage in this space. They want to be engaged. They want to make sure their leaders are engaged in this space and are taking action. And we'll take action here and address the issues that were uh, mentioned in the letter. And, and we welcome it. It was a great opportunity. I think we had a lot of that moving and we'll, we'll be considerate of, of the things that were mentioned in the letter. Thanks for the question, sir. Thanks, General Williams. Um, uh, General Evans, a, a two part question as, as coming from the audience. First, what have you learned from the other services in their ROTC programs that has been useful to you? And what changes have you directed uh, in the ROTC curriculum? I, and I know you have to work that obviously in, Conjunction with the host colleges and universities, but what what have you changed in the in the in the curriculum of ROTC as a result of uh, this emphasis on race and inclusiveness? Yeah, so gr great question, sir, and I appreciate whoever asked that. I will tell you that there's a lot to be learned from our joint service partners that are out there. I dialogue uh, with them. In fact, I was talking to the uh, the Naval Admiral who's in charge of ROTC for the Navy just last week, and we were sharing some best practices. Uh, I think we can take some pride in the fact that our officer corps tends to be, on average, a little bit more diverse uh, than the other uh, services. I think that's the nature of who we are as the Army, uh, and I think we ought to be proud of that fact. It doesn't mean we don't have work to do moving forward. Um, with regards to our curriculum, uh, we've really tried to focus the effort, like, like General Williams talked about, we're a values-based organization. And so at the very core of this question about um, – uh, racial injustice, racial discrimination, racism is, is really what underpins us as human beings, our values, right? We're going to bring kids in just like West Point does from across the country uh, to different colleges and universities. I think the seminal difference between the ROTC experience and the West Point experience is once they get to West Point, they'll enter that 47 month training model and there'll be a certain degree of conformity that occurs by virtue of the way they, they conduct that model. Uh, which, is, which is great because the standard is the same. They can apply it evenly, and I'm very envious of that because that's hard to do with 275 different ROTC programs. But I think the value that, that ROTC brings to our Army when we commissioned about 65% of the active uh, officer corps is that, uh, you know, cadets at, at uh, universities out there are going to be uh, cadets for a couple of hours a week, frankly. I mean, they're cadets all the time, but they're going to be in the classroom taking military science instruction for just a few hours a week. And the rest of the time, they're, they're college students. So they're out there interacting with this very interesting uh, college population that's out there that brings thoughts and ideas uh, and passion to all these discussions. And that, I think, makes us a little bit richer uh, for their experience when they come in and join us as Army lieutenants. 
our, our core curriculum has not changed significantly other than to say that we are reinvesting ourselves in the ethics of the profession and continuing to tell all of our cadets that at the very foundation of who they are as an officer are our Army Corps values. And I really can't underscore that enough because whether you can go out and run a, you know, a, a platoon raid or not is important. It's got its place. But if you can't use our Army Corps values as the foundation for the decisions that you'll make as a leader, for the way that you'll build teams, for the way that you will uh, encourage uh, inclusiveness, uh, then, then you're going to be at a loss. So I think that's the thing that we've tried to focus on the most, particularly in light of, of recent events and, and uh, some of the things we've uh, seen happen in the country. Yeah, thanks for that, General Evans. That's, that's, that's a, those are some very, very good insights. Um, and, and it brings, I think it highlights a, a question that also came in from the audience, Sergeant Major, that I think perhaps you're best suited to address. And that there's a generational aspect mm -hmm. to, to diversity and inclusiveness, you know, that, that the young women and men who are joining the Army today, enlisting or entering uh, the officer corps, you know, they come from a very different cultural generational experience than I did, certainly right. as, a, as a baby boomer. How, how have you seen that generational uh, aspect of, uh, of how diversity is viewed across the Army? So I would say that um, definitely as a whole, they are more receptive to acceptance of people's differences and where they come from. And they're definitely more willing to listen um, to where someone's story begins. So, uh, you know, as a, a drill sergeant for basic training, you know, we broke all that down. Um, you know, everything is a team building event, regardless of where you came from. So if you came from Wisconsin and the first minority that you saw was at basic training, it didn't matter if you came from, you know, the Bronx and grew up in a neighborhood where it was a square block and uh, you didn't deal with anybody that looked like a white person, really. Uh, it was really we we broke all of that down. And I think that Tradoc as a whole has the capability to really assimilate people into a pool and into the squad and into the platoon and into the company a lot easier because of the timelines and the churn of the training that we have to do that we don't have time to worry about all of the other little stuff. Um, and we focus on the fact that now you're part of the army team. These are the values. We beat it into them, not literally, but uh, you know, just through exercises and through training and um, an exceptional leadership across across the board really allows that to happen. And so I think that because of that, um, we have the capability to change whatever perceptions that they may have. Not completely. I'm not naive, but we give them the opportunity to see something that they haven't seen before and look outside of themselves just because of the way that we establish teams. Well, thanks. Thanks very much for that, Sergeant Major. And I, you know, having been on the receiving end of drill sergeant guidance many, many years ago, you know, it starts, I think one of the interesting things about the Army is it starts with changing behaviors. Right. You know, and behaviors are easier to change than beliefs, but you got to start somewhere. You got to start somewhere. Uh, and, and that is a, a very, very good place uh, uh, to, be, to begin. So we're just about out of time. We have time for one final question, but I would... I take this opportunity to thank each of our speakers today, uh, General Williams, General Evans, and Sergeant Major Guerra. Thank you very much. I, I hope for the audience this has been, as it has been for me, a, an enlightening experience, and hopefully it's triggered something in each of you in the audience to to want to pursue this further and and have these conversations uh, with uh, with those with whom you work, and 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 together we can make this move forward. So the last question, General Williams, is for you. Uh, and, and that really is the question on everyone's mind. And that is, how badly is Army going to beat Navy this year? Yes. Hey, sir, thanks for that question. Uh, it's going to be it's going to be a lot of pain. It'll be a lot of pain for it. I love my Navy brother and I love the jo I'm a joint part of a joint team. But uh, one day a year, uh, it's, it's not good to be a Navy fan. So, so we're thanks for that question. Go Army, be Navy. Thank cool. you. Sir. 
Cool. Yep, I think that's the same way. You know, as, as uh, when I was still wearing a uniform, I like, like you, you love your Navy brothers. And my my advice to them was, I hope you win every football game except one. You know, <laughs> and uh, so we'll see. So again, to, to each of our speakers today, thank you so very much uh, for your remarks, your insights today. Thank you even more for the example that each of you set for a rising cohort of, of soldiers, non-commissioned officers, and officers, and for your lifelong of service and commitment to the Army and, and to our nation. We are honored at AUSA that the three of you have, have joined us today. So thank you uh, very, very much. Before we close, uh, a couple of previews of some upcoming events here at AUSA. On September 14th, we'll have a noon report with the senior enlisted advisor to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Ramon C.Z. Colon Lopez. So we hope you will join us September 14th for that noon report. We'll have our next noon report on an Army discussion on race on September 16th. And joining us on September 16th, Dr. Casey Wardinsky, Assistant Secretary of the Army for Manpower and Reserve Affairs. He'll be joined by Mr. Anselm Beach, Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Army for Equality and, in and Inclusion, Lieutenant General Gary Brito, the Army G-1, uh, and Command Sergeant Major John Sampa, the Command Sergeant Major of the Army National Guard. And lastly, in 40 days, 40 days, uh, the AUSA Now, our 2020 annual meeting will begin online, 13 through 16 October. And I know you're all accustomed to joining us at the DC Convention Center. We're not able to do that this year. We hope even more of you will join us online 13 through 16 October for AUSA Now. For information on these events to register, go to the AUSA website at AUSA.org. And finally, let me thank each and every one of you who is an AUSA member. The reality is we can't do programs like this we can't support the Army without your membership, and your membership really does matter. If you're not a member, which kind of surprises me, frankly, uh, or if your membership has, has lapsed, just go to AUSA.org, check your membership, join us today, uh, and be part of this great team. Thank you very much. And again, thanks to our speakers today, and thanks to each of you for joining us. Hope you have a great Army day.